I represent who I am. My name is Thor Rollins. I work at Nelson Laboratories. Um, I worked at Nelson about 15 years. Um, Nelson is a, a, a CRO, uh, does uh, clinical testing for medical devices. Um, and uh, my, I've been 15 years working in biocompatibility, so that's kind of what my love is. Um, I sit on the TC194 working group, which is the ISO group that writes the standards for biocompatibility. And in fact, before I start, there's been, well, for me, exciting news. You guys probably don't care as much. But um, in 2013, the FDA released a guidance document for biocompatibility. It was a draft. Um, today, actually, the last 20 minutes, they just released their final uh, document. Um, I wish we could just sit here and go through that together because I haven't read it. It's like 260 pages long, so I haven't sat down and gone through it yet. Uh, but that's not why we're here. And uh, so we're going to be talking about changes to a device and how to evaluate it with biocompatibility. But look at our website. We will be having shortly, probably in the next week, um, a white paper released about the new guidance document from the FDA, going through what changes are in there, how it might impact the uh, industry as a whole. I just wanted to let you guys know, if you want to run to the website, you can pull it up now and, and look at it. So that's kind of how we're going to start it off. Okay, so changes. Um, it, it's funny because as long as I've worked at Nelson Labs, I think probably the majority of my work is associated with different generations of devices. It just seems like engineers can't just keep things the same. They always have to fiddle, which is great. Uh, but what that means is that once we change something in a medical device, we have to evaluate the impact of that change on safety. And it could be a change in materials, it could be a change in processing, it could be a change in geometry, um, even the manufacturing location. All of that could have an impact in biocompatibility. So today, I'm hoping that I'll give you guys some ideas on how to think through the impact of a change and then some tools to be able to assess to see if that change really did have an impact in safety. Now, I kind of liked this, this quote. It says, any change, even a change for the better, is always accompanied by drawbacks and discomforts. Um, from a biocompatibility standpoint, I think that kind of sets home that even if we're improving the product, even if we're putting in, like we think, a better material or we're improving a process, we still have to evaluate the impact of safety. And even if the, from a functionality standpoint, we think it's a better product, uh, we still have to evaluate have we impacted the safety of that device? And that's where biocompatibility comes in. So I kind of gave you a, a precursor here to this, but I've kind of seen four main changes when I've looked at medical devices. The first one, which we mostly see are materials. Um, and we're kind of going through to evaluate an impact of a material change in a minute. But we see that a lot. Either a supplier runs out of a material and you have to switch to a material that they claim is the same, um, or you change suppliers, or you change locations of the material, or you actually just change a material. You go from a 304 to a 316 stainless steel. What does that mean to the, the patient? Does it mean anything? Um, and that's the kind of uh, questions that we're gonna try to answer today. We talked about manufacturing. I think this is probably the biggest uh, pet peeve from the FDA that I see. Uh, we have companies who submit their uh, uh, devices to the FDA and they say, my device is safe, it's made out of stainless steel and polypropylene, all those materials have a long history of safe use, I don't have to do biocompatibility. Has anyone ever seen someone try to do that or heard about that? Yeah, I can guarantee you the FDA is going to come back and say that biocompatibility is just not about materials, it's about processing residuals. What we do to that device has a big impact on biocompatibility. So, even though you are using the same materials, if you change a manufacturing location, or a process, like sterilization even, that could have an impact on your safety. I'll give you an example. We had a device that was being made in California, and it was a kind of a startup company, and they were making it in their small facility. Well, after they um, did their biocompatibility, everything was fine, everything was great, they um, grew, like a good startup should do, and they had to get it to a new facility. So they, they um, rented a nice little facility that across the street or down the street, I can't remember exactly, but it was close by. And they got in and they, they moved the same machines, 
the same workers, everything else into this new facility. So everything, the suppliers, the material, the machines, and the workers were all the same. Just the location was different. They did a risk assessment and said, look, we don't have to redo any biocompatibility because we haven't changed the product. Someone in that facility said, let's just run a cytotoxicity test, which we'll go through today as one of your tools, just to see. It's cheap, it's quick, let's run it. So they ran a cytotox on a device that was made in the old facility and one that was made in their new facility. And guess what? The new facility failed and the old facility passed. And they went, what? How's that possible? It's the same device, the same everything. How can we fail in our new facility? So we did a little bit of chemistry to try to investigate why we're seeing issues. And so we compared, and we'll show you this in a minute too, but we, share, we compared the chemistry, the leachables from the two devices, and there's this one compound that was coming off the new device that wasn't coming off the old device. And when we did some investigation, it was a compound that was used in surfboard making. And they just happened to move next door to a surfboard company, and that chemical was getting into the ventilating system and then falling down onto their product, okay? So, it was their neighbor that was causing the issues. So that kind of shows you the impact that we can have in our processing. And maybe they didn't have the controls that they thought they did in their manufacturing lines. But that's why the FDA requires just not material evaluation, but residual or cleanliness evaluation on these medical devices. Because most of the time, when we see failures, it's not from the materials. It's from what's left on after the manufacturing. Oils, uh, cleaners, things like that that are left behind. That's where we mostly see problems with. Okay, so we can use all these different techniques to try to evaluate a change. Really when it comes down to it though, is you guys just have to be kind of smart enough to analyze what's happening and decide what testing to do to evaluate if that change has had an impact. And that's what we're gonna kind of go through today. So, but I want you to remember, every change should at least go through evaluation. I don't mean every change has to do testing. I mean, that's up to you guys, but they should have at least an evaluation done. Any change in your protocols, if there's a change, an evaluation for biocompatibility should be performed. So, with a change, with, especially with materials, it's all about the surface area in, uh, that the change is happening. So, with toxicology, you'll hear dose makes the poison, okay? So, water can be toxic if you drink too much of it, right? And even the most toxic substances, if it's a very small amount, you won't feel an effect. So dose makes the poison. With the change in device, that's also the truth. We base all our sample preparation on our uh, testing off a of surface area to volume ratios. Which means, if this is my medical device up here, you know, it's going to save millions of people. You can't see it, but there's a little red line for a laser. Okay? So that makes me be able to shoot people. Well, let's say that a doctor loves that red, okay? Let's say they, they went to a college with red in their college and they said, if you give me red devices, I'll buy 20 times more of them or whatever. So the marketing per person says, we need to make our device red, right? So you think, no big deal, because why well, you already have red in our device. So if I just increase the red, it's the same device, the same material, the same intended use, no big deal. But you gotta think about the dose makes the poison, right? In this device, that red is a small percentage. So if it's toxic, it could be diluted out by all the other safe material. But now if I increase the surface area of that red, now it starts becoming a heavier dose to the patient and start, it could become toxic now. Same material, but now we can start delivering more of that to the patient. So when you look at this chart, this chart's out of ISO 10993-12. It's the sample preparation. And at, you guys might not be able to read it, but at the bottom down here, it, and this is a screen so my pointer doesn't work, but at the bottom it says plus or minus 10% surface area. What that means is that a lab has a kind of a variance that we can have some cushion in our surface area calculations of 10%. So if we calculate this, this device to be 80 centimeters squared and another lab calculates it to be 75 centimeters squared, the results can be comparable because they're within 10% of each other, okay? I use that same ra rationale to evaluate the impact of a change, where if it's less than 10% of the surface area of the device, that change may not be as impactful. We may be able to use less uh, testing to evaluate that change. If it's between 10 and 50% of the device changing, then we might have to do more testing to evaluate the impact. 
If it's over 50%, guess what? It's a brand new device, right? And in that case, we might have to repeat our biocompatibility. So those are kind of general guidelines that I use in evaluating the impact of a change to a device. So let's get you an idea of what changes can happen or what kind of sample preparation impact can have. This is a real life example of a device. It's a partial knee implant. It's made out of cobalt chrome and, and some hard plastic, okay? Real common kind of device that we see every day. If we take the mass of that device, it's point, um, it's, the mass of this device is 93.9 grams. That's how heavy it is, right? In the standard, we have a ratio of 0.2 grams per mil, which means for every 0.2 grams, we add a mil of extraction fluid. So this one device would get almost 500 mils of extraction fluid added to a test, okay? The same device using the same standard allows us to use surface area too. Surface area of this uh, device is 115.8 centimeters squared. So using our, the surface area ratio, we would add 38.6 mils or almost 40 mils of extraction fluid. Now remember, same device using the same standard, just the two options, right, gives us this much difference in volume. The weight gives us 500 mils about, the surface area gives us about 40 mils, that's a 12 times difference. What that means is that by weight, we would dilute out this test by 12. So if there is something toxic in there, if you did it by weight, you probably would not see a response. Or by surface area, you probably would. For that reason, the FDA prefers surface area. That also makes this easy to evaluate change. If a change happens on a patient contacting portion of the device, the percentage of impact in that surface area of that change to that patient contacting portion is help, helps us evaluate it. Now, I do want to make clear that we're only talking about patient contacting portions, either directly or indirectly. Direct means that the device is directly touching the patient, either on its skin or inside the body. Indirect means either air or fluid goes through the materials into the patient. That's an indirect contact. We do not consider someone touching the handle of a device and then touching the patient as indirect contact. If that was the case, everything in the surgical suite would be indirect contact, right? Only indirect contact really is fluid or gas bath running through the materials to the patient. So if you are making a change to the handle of your device, then you can justify that that is not to a patient contacting portion, and you still may want to do a cytotox, make sure there's no transfer during sterilization or something like that, but the impact is much less than if you're changing something to the patient contacting portion. Also, when you're calculating the surface area of impact, that 10%, do not consider all the non-patient contacting portions in that ratio. Because if you're changing the distal end of a delivery device and you include all the handle components, then that's gonna make like a lot less of an impact to the patient than if you just do the, the distal end of the device. Does that make sense? So really concentrate on what's contacting the patient as, as kind of your scenario for impact for toxicity. So this is, and by the way, oh yeah, you have a question real fast? Say, sorry, can you say that again? For something as volume, how are you gonna define which is patient contacting and patient non-contacting? Because something which is inside a lumen is like, it is very hard to say whether it is patient contacting. Are there any strict guidelines which define which is patient contacting and which is patient non-contacting? Yeah, very good question. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's really easy to define what's patient contacting and what's not, right? So if you have an implant, everything is patient contacting. If you have a delivery device for that patient, for that implant, some distal end to the proximal end is gonna contact the patient. What we try to do is try to estimate where that worst case is, like how much of that could go into the patient, and that's where we stop our test. Either we just extract to that point, or we, if we can cut it, we'll cut it off at that point. But we don't want to include anything else because then we could be diluting out our test and hiding something that's toxic. So there might be a little bit of a gray area, but we want to consider what worst case contacting would be. Is there something about how long this device is inside it, if it's say, an hour long, or if, and if, the, if you're doing a procedure, if a device, a delivery device is in, inside the lumen or something for an hour long, so 
how how would time play into this like very good question so i don't really talk about it in this presentation but if you guys want so there's a chart in iso 10993 that tells you what testing you have to do for length of contact and we have that chart in a slide rule because engineers like to use slide rules so um we have it up here so if you have two components of your device that have different dwell times so if one of your components only contact the body for one hour and then you have another one that has an implantation for example if you read the fda guidance document you have to test them separately according to uh, impact. So they have different dwell times. They have to be considered separate. That answer your question? Good questions. It's much easier to have a discussion than me just rambling. So thank you for your, your question. I appreciate it. Oh, and I was going to say, if you guys want copies of these slides, I'm not quite sure if they're available or not. But if you want to give me your business card or stop by my booth at 1838, we'll, we can send you the copy of these slides. So you don't have to try to remember all this. OK. so. I'm going to give you some tools that we use to evaluate changes. And uh, these are by large not the only tests you have to run. But what we've seen are they're useful tests that are cheap and quick, which everyone likes, but they also help you evaluate the impact. And it may lead you to more testing if there's differences, but that's kind of what their tools are. They're quick and cheap to help you evaluate the impact of a change. So we have cytotoxicity, which we'll kind of talk about here first, FTIR and then an extractable leachable testing, uh, which there's no way I can go over that whole thing in 30 minutes what we have left, right? So it's a very high level, um, but there's plenty of uh, s seminars out there about extractable leachable, um, or if you want to talk about it more in depth, there's lot there, we could, we could send the whole afternoon together. So uh, just let me know. So first off, cytotox. Now, cytotox, I always say, is your best friend and your worst enemy. And the reason I say that is because it's by far the cheapest and quickest biocompatibility test we do. Um, at Nelson Labs, we do it about four to five days. It costs about $160. Um, and so it's cheap and quick, relatively speaking, to biocompatibility. And so that's why it's your best friend. The, sometimes it's your worst enemy. It's because by far it's the most sensitive test we do for biocompatibility. In a review at Nelson Laboratories, um, if, you go, if you're going to fail a biocompatibility test, this thing fails about 92 to 93% of the uh, failures. Not time, that would be ridiculous. But if you're going to fail, this test fails about, uh, the, this would be your failure about 92 to 93% of the time. So it's very sensitive. But that's why it's a good screening test, because it's, it's a good way to look at compounds. And it's very sensitive for cleaners, for oils, um, for metals, uh, specifically like copper, zinc, um, and silver, and even gold, depending on how, how much gold comes off. So these are good screening. These are some of those materials that are left behind during processing. So it's a great screening test for that kind of thing. How we run it is up in that corner up there, you see a flask. Well, this is kind of like my cell farm. We use a cell line called L929 cells. It's a mouse fibroblast cell line. And we use it, one, because fibroblasts make fibrogen, which happens to be over most of your body. But two, it's just the standard cell line that everybody uses. So when your score comes out there, the FDA can kind of compare it against what they've seen historically. So it's a very good cell line we, that we can use. Plus, it's really easy to grow up, which makes it a cheap test. So we grow them up in those flasks. And then when they start to cover the bottom of that flask, we break them up into individual cells and we place some of them down on those wells in the plate. So now these cells kind of settle on the bottom of the plate and they cover the complete bottom of that plate. Now we can test on the cells. So we take that liquid that your sample's been extracting in, uh, that's been sucking out those chemicals, and we put it onto the cells themselves. Now those chemicals are interacting with the cells and the cells can either bring them into the cell membrane or whatever they would do to them, metabolize them. And then if they're toxic, they will impact the cells. So we put them down, I forget this doesn't work on a TV. They put them down on those cells and then we either let them sit there for 48 or 72 hours and we just look at the impact. Now important thing about biocompatibility and about cytotoxicity is the standard requires that our tests be extracted both in a polar and nonpolar extract. Do you guys know what a polar and nonpolar is? Best vegetable oil and, and vinegar salads, you know, they separate. That's a polar and nonpolar. Well, we have stuff in our body that will come off in polar, and we have stuff in our body, body that only come off in oils or nonpolar. So 
Um, and our devices are sitting in fat tissue and in blood and in sweat and things like that. So we, they get exposed to both polar and nonpolar. So the standard requires us to extract both in a polar and nonpolar. On this side, we have our known polar options. And on this side, we have our polar options. If you look at the bottom, cell culture media is actually in both. And the reason why is because we kind of cheat with cytotoxicity. We can't extract in any of those nonpolar, strict nonpolars because they're all cytotoxic. If you put oil on a cell line, they just, it just kills the cells. So we can't really extract in a pure nonpolar media. So what we do is we have a cell culture media and it contains 5% calf serum. Now, serum is nonpolar, so we, we have a 5% nonpolarity uh, component. So we kind of fudge a little bit and say that it's both polar and nonpolar. But in, re in, in reality, it's majority polar. And for that reason, there could be a compound on your device that's strip, strictly lipophilic, which means it comes out just in oils that the cytotox may not be able to pull off. And that's why it may not be 100% the most sensitive test. But most of the time, we get most of the device uh, compounds off. So for cytotox, that's why I put this up here so you understand that we only extract in one media. It's that MEM fluid, and it kind of has both a polar and nonpolar. So if the FDA asks you, you can kind of be smart and respond to them. Okay, so this is the dashboard for cytotoxicity. So I've already told you this, but we have some sample requirements over there. It doesn't take a whole lot of sample to run the test. The turnaround time, that's what TAT stands for. It's a quick test. And then some of the usual problems. Latex is our positive control. So if you have any latex in your device, guess what? It's going to fail. Um, we talked about uh, natural rubber, or we talked about silver and copper and zinc. The other thing that we see a lot with cytotoxicity is curing problems. And that could be with adhesives. It also could be with inks, okay? Um, at Nelson Labs, we call it the smell test. If you guys ever open up a bag and you just go, whoa, there's a strong chemical smell coming off of it. Well, if you can smell it, those are volatile organic compounds coming off. And if you can smell it, guess what's happening when you put it at 37 degrees in media? All those things are coming off into the solution. So if we smell it, we go, yeah, that's probably not going to pass. We test it and go, yep, yeah, we were right again. So I'm not saying that that's a validated test that you can ask for at Nelson Labs. So there's no test code. But um, it's a way for you to kind of understand that if you, if you smell something strong coming off, that's probably not a good sign for cytotoxicity. So remember that. The other thing to remember with that is there are adhesives that are claiming to be non-cytotoxic. Um, they are, but remember when they test it, they test it in their best case scenario for them, which is a very thin layer of adhesive that's cured all the way. I know because I test those things for them. So when they're used in life in, in your, for your devices, a lot of times you guys try to put like a big glob of it and try to get two uh, maybe polymers together. Um, so it may not be cured the same and you still may have some toxicity from that adhesive, even though it's claiming to be non-cytotoxic, and maybe if it's cured all the way. So once we get that solution on the cells, then we evaluate toxicity by looking at a score from zero to four, okay? And this scoring grade is both in the ISO 10993-5 standard and the USP87 standard, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's harmonized across both standards. Um, the actual scoring grade is right here from zero to four. What you need to know is two or less is considered passing. Right now, it's the only biocompatibility that has acceptance criteria in the standard. Uh, that might change soon because for some reason, no one likes to say what's pass or fail in the standard, and so they want us to take it out. Uh, I actually like it in there, so I'm trying to fight that, but I'm fighting a losing battle. So maybe one, the next revision will have it off, but it will still be was zero, one, two, pass, three, four, fell. I mean, that's just what everyone kind of knows about the cytotoxicity test. So to show you how sensitive it is, you can have up with a two, which is passing, you can have up to 50% of your cells affected and still pass. And that just shows you how sensitive this test really is, if you can have up to half the cells um, affected. So I am... Um, I don't know if you guys in the back there, if, if it's able to, can you try to push on this? I don't know if it will work or not, but this is a video. Is there a way to uh, see if it will run? Oh. Yeah, just click on it, see if it will go. Okay. 
It might not. Sometimes when I transfer it to a new computer, it doesn't. That's too bad because this is the geekiest thing I have, which I really like. But basically what we did is we took, this is the L929 cells, and we put it into an incubating microscope. Okay, so for eight hours, it just stood um, and grew, and we got to see it divide and grow. Like, I think it's the coolest thing ever. A lot of people don't, but that's okay. So, you, but that's the cell line. In fact, here, right here, is what they look like after 48 hours, which is a zero. Okay, some of the things you want to look for is you want to see the cells grow across the bottom of the plate. You want to see them reaching out, making those connections. Um, that means it's a healthy cell line. Also, you see the little red in the cells? That's a neutral red stain, which is a viable stain, which means healthy, happy cells bring them into their cell uh, lysosomes. So we stain them to make sure that they're healthy and happy. So we want to see that red. That's compared to that, okay? That's uh, not a good sign. If you see that, then I'm sorry, you're, you've not done what you should do uh, with your cell test. So you see the difference, hopefully. So that's a four, that's actually latex. Uh, a latex is a fixative, which means it kind of fixes or burns the cells to the bottom of the plate. So what you see at the bottom there is actually kind of um, a wasteland of cells, okay? So it's kind of, kind of ugly. That one down at the bottom may still be alive, but it's barely holding on for dear life. So that's what you don't want to see, okay? Now, that's a zero, that's a four. Those are easy to do. I could probably train each of you in a couple hours to spot a zero or four, but the hard thing is when you're trying to spot a, zero, a one, two, or three, right? So if there's a one, two, or three, we usually have to have another person come in to independently score to back up what we scored it as. But that's the big downfall with the MEM test. It's a quantitative test that, that you have to really know what you're doing to get a good, uh, solid result. Because of that, there is a push to make uh, other cytotoxicity tests um, in the standard, uh, MTT, XTT, Nutri-Red uptake. The problem, and I'm just gonna be very quick about this, the problem with those tests is they're more sensitive right now than the cytotox, the MEM elution. So if we're already making this the most sensitive test and we're making it more sensitive, that's maybe not be the smart thing to do. So where there's a lot of discussion in the standard committee right now about exactly what we wanna do with the cytotoxicity test, but right now, the MEM elution test for the FDA is still a very good test to do. Uh, it's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's less sensitive than the MTT, XTT. So for evaluating changes, I recommend it. Any questions about cytotox before we move on? Okay. If anybody wants to see that black and white movie on my laptop, I might will just sit down and show it and have, eat popcorn and have a good time. So the next one we're gonna use is FTIR. Do you guys familiar with FTIR? It's a very common chemistry test, uh, Fourier transform infrared spectrophotometry, spectrophotometry. And um, basically what it does is it looks at a pinpoint on the device. That's really the downfall of the FTIR, is you can't really screen a whole device. It's really good for a very small part. But if you're only changing a part, then it's great because what it can do is after you uh, scan it, it can compare that scan to another scan and give you, now I'm not a chemist, so this is technically wrong, but it's not wrong. It gives you a percent match. It doesn't really give you a percent match. It compares the scans. I, I'm not a chemist. They say it's not, it is. It gives you a percent match. And so that percent match will actually tell you how closely similar those bonds are. And that helps you evaluate that when you're changing a material to a new material, that they are the same. Or if you're changing sterilization cycles, you wanna make sure that that change hasn't changed the material. That's a good way to do it, to make sure that the change of heat, or even from EO to radiation, which a lot of times you will see a change, so be careful. But this FTIR will allow you to evaluate if there's been a change. So this is the not percent comparison, where you actually have the, the um, different peaks and valleys, okay? Each one of those peaks is a uh, part where the FTIR hit. And then you actually see, um, you can't see it because it's small, but it says a 95.5 match. That's not a percentage, but we treat it as a percentage, right? So it's a 95% match one another. What we've seen from the FDA is if you're greater than 90%, then we can, comp we can say that they're similar, okay? Nothing, no, I shouldn't say nothing, very rarely will you see 100%. Sometimes you'll see 99.9%, but very rarely you'll see 100%. So if you're waiting for 100%, you're gonna be waiting for a long time. Above 90% is a good comparison. Okay, then 
next tool that you can use is one that's very useful for changes. In fact, in my opinion, chemical characterization finds its, its teeth when you're comparing changes. A lot of people, we, we also use this to get out of genotoxicity and subacute subchronic toxicity tests. It's very good for that. But if you're looking for chemistry to eliminate biocompatibility, then you have to wait a long time because the FDA is not there yet. Europe's much closer to that, but the FDA is not there. So a lot of people get frustrated with chemical characterization because they want it to be biocompatibility and that's it. It's not there yet. It does allow you to get out of some biocompatibility, but when you're changing a device, it is excellent. And the reason why is because you really get an idea of what the chemistry is from both the change in the original to evaluate the impact. It gives you actual data which you can make an evaluation from. So, what is extractable leachables? The first thing you have to realize is that they are different. We kind of use them like they're the same term, but they're really not. A leachable is a chemical compound that will come off your device under normal clinical conditions. So, if it's used for an hour inside the body, a leachable is something that comes off under 37 degrees Celsius for one hour. Okay? And we use uh, physiological uh, conditions like saline or whatever it is that we can try to use to be very gentle with the device. So we want to see what comes off under clinical conditions. An extractable is what comes off under worst case conditions. We elevate the temperature 50 degrees or 70 degrees C. We use harsh solvents, maybe like hexane or methylene chloride. Um, we, we extract it for 72 hours instead of one hour or whatever it is. So really, for the most part, leachables are a subset of extractables, okay? So extractables are more, usually. Sometimes you'll see a little bit difference depending on how the test is set up between leachables and extractables, but for the most part, leachables are a subset of extractables. When you're doing a comparison, a lot of times when you're doing to evaluate a change, a lot of times we don't have to use extractables. We can use leachables to evaluate the change. If you're doing it for biocompatibility, we use extractables because it's worst case. And if it's safe worst case, then we can justify that leachables will be fine too. Okay? So that's where the difference is. You can definitely use extractables to evaluate changes. The risk is your extractables are much greater, right? So there's a lot more to evaluate. And so if you're just looking at the impact of a change, usually leachables are a better way to go. Does that make sense? Okay, so these are some of the things that we look for when we use chemical characterization. We look for volatile and semi-volatile compounds, okay? Uh, those are some examples of volatile and semi-volatile. Um, the best way to explain a volatile compound is like alcohol. So you put some alcohol on um, the table, you kind of wait, what happens? It disappears, right? That's because alcohol is a volatile. It evaporates very quickly. And that's really all volatile and semi-volatile and non-volatile means is how fast do they evaporate. A volatile compound will evaporate very quickly. Semi-volatile will kind of evaporate over a time. And a non-volatile, you, you have to wait a while, okay? Um, we also have metals. And some of the other things that the FDA are really concerned about are phthalates, which are plasticizers, where if you have a water bottle that says D A D B. DHP or BEP free, then those are plastic, uh, plasticizers. Uh, the FDA has some concern right now with plasticizers. And then colorants, okay? I'm, just, I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time in my soapbox on colorants, but please don't color your device unless you absolutely have to. If your marketing person comes to you and says, please color this purple, you go no until they make you do it, and then we'll have a discussion. But uh, right now, colorants are a hot topic with the FDA. They just did a whole webinar probably about six months ago about it uh, that you can listen to. We can get around it. It's just, especially if it's a permanent contacting device, it's a pain, okay? So don't color it unless you have to. So these are the things that we can look for for extractable leachables. The non-volatiles, and this is where I think the change helps, is really a big change, right? That's where the oils are. That's where the cleaners are. That's where the changes from a process may be where if you're changing a material, then the volatiles and semi-volatiles might be more impactful, okay? So what does a GC look for? These are some of the techniques that we use for leachable extractable. A GCMS, or gra grass chromatography mass spec, that looks for the volatile and semi-volatile compounds. It's actually probably the most useful chemistry tool we have for extractable leachables. It covers the most of the things. So 
what makes um, a volatile compound volatile is it has a small molecular weight. And those, that means it evaporates off pretty quickly. That also means it goes into your body quickly. So those tend to be pretty toxic. Um, those, there are also obviously toxic compounds that are non-volatile, like some metals and some uh, the plasticizers. But the GCs are ones that we want to look for. They're very useful. Uh, we can screen for hundreds of compounds using GC and GCMS to be able to detect what's coming off your device. They're also able to quantify that amount, which is key, right? Knowing what they are is not as helpful as knowing how much of it's there, especially when you're trying to do a comparison. So that's important. This is what the GC gives you, okay? Just gives you a bunch of peaks that are representing different compounds. What we do is compare those peaks with your predicate device to see if there are more or different types to evaluate the impact of that change. This allows you to have relatively inexpensive tests to be able to justify that no biocompatibility is needed because the chemical footprint may be the exactly the same as the predicate device and the change had little impact, okay? I would still run a cytotoxicity test just because it's cheap, quick, and sensitive to, to include on that. The ICPMS is another one that we use quite regularly to look at the change. And this has to do with the direct change from a material. The ICPMS looks for metals, okay? And metals just happen to be, talk, a lot of metals are toxic. Um, if you start looking at, well, mercury, I think everybody knows, right? Lead, I think everybody knows. But even certain amounts of like copper and nickel and zinc will become toxic depending on the amount. So an ICPMS will be able to compare these amounts of metals from your your predicate device and your new de your change device to be able to evaluate to see if that change has made a toxicological impact. The benefit of this is even if you see a different metal come off. So let's say we see copper come off uh, stainless steel that you did not see before. And that might be a concern, but when, then we can take a step further and we can do a tox evaluation on that copper. And it might be a very small amount of copper that we conclude that it's not uh, toxicologically important. So there, once again, we've eliminated the need to redo your biocompatibility. So just because you see a difference doesn't mean that you have to repeat your biocomp. It depends what it is and how much of it's there. So it, that gives you a little bit, an extra step to alleviate the need to do extra biocompatibility. The last one we're going to talk about is LCMS, and this is liquid chromatography mass spec. This looks at non-volatiles. And, and honestly, this is one of the most frustrating ones that we do. The reason why is because this isn't like the GC that has tons of compounds validated, libraries out there that we can screen for, that's very easy to run. The non-volatiles, uh, the LCMS, we really have to know what we're looking for to find it. I kind of take it as if you tell me to go into a dark room and you don't tell me what I'm looking for and give me a very small flashlight, I'm not going to be very successful. But if you tell me I'm looking for a blue shoe, and you give me a big light, I can find that blue shoe, right? That's LCMS. So if we know what we're looking for, we can find it, right? But if we don't know what we're looking for, we're probably not gonna find it. So the other ones we can, but this one we have to know. So this is, has to do where if we know what you're doing in your process, if you're changing an oil or you're changing something in that line that's a non-volatile, that's okay, we know what we're looking for and we can go in and look for it. Okay? But if we don't know what we're looking for, this becomes a less useful technique. The other thing that may have an impact, right, is the change of the device by geometry. Now the geometry change does not have a change in leachables for the most part usually, but it can have the change in the particulate generation and also when you look at hemocompatibility and implantation. If you change a geometry of a device to sharp edges or rough surfaces, that could change how it interacts with blood flow or with tissue. So it doesn't change a lot of the biocompatibility, but it could change how it impacts in those tests. So just changing the geometry of a device could have an impact that you have to evaluate. So you have to know if I'm changing geometry, I have to look at hemocompatibility if you're in the blood flow, or I have to look at implantation to evaluate the impact of that change, okay? So in conclusion, we have to determine the percentage of surface area that the, the changes happen. We have to look at the materials itself and the process and what kind of history those materials have. We might have to do some chemistry or some biocompatibility like cytotoxicity tests to evaluate that. 
But then you have to put that all in a review and justify why you're accepting the change. Okay, that's important. Please put in your protocols that any change has to be evaluated and then generate a report. You can have us help you generate a report. We, we do that to, to justify accepting a change. And we can point to these tests that you've run to be able to validate what changes are needed. If you have any questions about what tests are needed, depending on the change, that's what we do. We, we can sit down, go through it. We can talk about what testing we think is, is necessary, how to set it up, and then we can write up the assessment at the back end for you, or we can help you do it yourselves. Uh, we're more than happy to do either of those options. So, depending on that change, those are some of the tests you have to do. You may just have to redo Biocomp if the change is, is large enough or impactful enough. Any final questions? Yes. In your Very good question. In case you didn't hear it, what's in my experience, is there a difference between changing a device already on the market and one that's already going through your processes? Actually, it's a, what I've seen, it's actually a little easier for something already on the market because you can draw from history of safe use, you can draw from your 510K, you can draw from whatever you already have, and it gives a lot more emphasis on a predicate device, right? If you don't have a predicate device that is on the market, that's shown to be safe, that you know exactly what the processing is, and everything like that, it becomes more difficult. So when we change a device that's in manufacturing at that moment, then we have to be more reliant on like the chemistry. What's coming off? What's the difference between it? Have you done biocomp before? All these kind of things. So it comes a little bit more cloudy, not impossible, just a little bit more difficult. Much easier if it's on the market already. Does that answer your question? Okay. In your experience, you say um, pretty much any transfers from uh, one manufacturer to a new manufacturer, even if they're making same product to make that product. It's still the same design, same dimensions. Is that pretty much one of the more challenging to So if you didn't hear his question, it says, if, if you're just changing uh, manufacturings and everything is the same, right? The, the materials, the processing, the tooling may be different, right? But uh, most of the things are the same. Is that, is that one of the more challenging ones to justify at a biocomp? Actually, those ones are a little bit easier because you look, if the materials and processing are the, are the same, most of your concerns have been met. But you still need to evaluate what that change in tooling may do. Like, is there, an, is there a new component used in that tooling, um, new uh, oil or whatever? Or, like I talked about at the beginning, I don't know if you were here, that whole lo uh, location may add a new variable as far as fallout to that device. But it usually is easier because all the other variables like materials and processing are the same. So you're really just looking at some simple chemistry or biocompatibility tests just to verify and then you should be fine. Would you say that um, those screening steps that you're talking about would be a good first step to determine if you need to go that step? Yes, these screening tests are exactly what I would do to determine the impact. If you are able to show that through these screening tests that nothing's the same or nothing's different, everything is the same, and the cytotox passes, I think there you feel confident in justifying that the change has not impacted biocompatibility. Any other questions? Okay, if you do have any specific ones, I'll be here for a little while and also at booth 1838. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it.